basically we're dealing with three levels of contracts it's like the matrix there's contracts within contracts within contracts the event organizer let's say euro or olympics or the tennis match they have a contract with a lot of sponsors and these sponsors can be drinks companies can be sports apparel they can be toys so this is the important contract with the organizer but the drinks companies etc don't have a direct relationship with the athletes the organizer then has to make a contract with let's say the individual athletes but it gets more complicated if it's a euro competition where there are teams involved or some kind of club competition where there are clubs involved because then the organizer has to make a contract with the club or with the local football association and then the football association has to make a contract with the individual players so let's recap you got the sponsor he makes a contract with the event organizer the event organizer then makes a contract with the association. The association then makes a contract with the individual sportsman. And what we have in the Ronaldo situation is that the guy at one end of the contract is having a problem with the sponsor at the other end of the contract, but they have no direct relationship. So somebody has to go through each stage of the contract to make sure that it is all back to back. And most of the time, it's not. There are tons of loopholes. Now that's one. The second thing is this. These contracts don't worth anything. They're not worth anything unless there are fans. And the fans pay attention to their sporting heroes because they hold them up in high esteem as being people who embody certain values. So when, when you have somebody like Cristiano Ronaldo, um, you say, this guy is worth a lot because if he endorses something, his fans will listen to him. That's because the fans respect his opinion. So if Cristiano Ronaldo says, this is a healthy way to consume um, and this is not a healthy way to consume. That is very important. Now, if you're a sponsor, you say, oh, Cristiano Ronaldo, I now hereby sue you because you did not stick to your contract and you caused me a lot of loss. That's not going to help your brand because the fans are going to say, well, in that case, this reinforces our belief that your brand and your product is no good because our hero, Cristiano Ronaldo, does, has rejected it. So basically, even if the sponsor is right and even if contract is on his side, he shouldn't take action because in taking action, all he's doing is hammering in this message and this image in the public's mind that they are something that the hero doesn't endorse. There are some brand that the hero has rejected. So now whenever you start to Google Coca-Cola, you will see the Cristiano Ronaldo news pop up. And if you Google Cristiano Ronaldo, you will see the Coca-Cola news pop up. This is not good. So putting aside legalities as a brand, you don't want that kind of relationship. Now, in the old days, there will always be these problems because the sportsmen um, nobody thinks about the sportsman. Everybody places value on the sportsman as a product, but they don't go ahead and consult him and say, can we get you to agree to do this, this, and this? The easier way to do this is to tell the athletes before you go on, hey, our sponsors are this, this, and this. So when you get onto the press conference, there's going to be this, this, and this in front of you. Is that okay? Because if it's not okay, we're going to remove it because we don't want you to get up there, look at the thing, and then you remove it. That's a lot worse. So the alternative is after the event happens, you just try and put out the fire.
just as just as Coke is doing now, the best thing they can do, yeah, and they're doing the right thing, they're saying, look, this is all about individual choice, blah, blah. The worst thing they can do is sue. Because once you sue, you're just adding oxygen to the fire. And this is not what you want. Um, let's take the Naomi Osaka example. So this is someone who's contractually bound to give press conferences because the organizers figure that it's a business and the stars come and play, but people also want to watch and listen to the stars after the whole event is over. You want to ask them questions. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? That adds to the publicity and you can keep the media circus going. Now, the problem is that um, these stars, I figure they're not prepared. Um, in the case of Naomi Osaka, she's suffering from depression. You can take it as any form of illness. Um, let's say uh, a male uh, tennis star like Roger Federer. Let's say instead of having a mental illness, he has a physical illness, which prevents him from going to the press conference. Let's say during the game, he hurts his ankle. Then he will say, all right, I can't do the press conference. My ankle hurts or I have trouble breathing. Everyone will be okay with that, right? Everyone will say, okay, I'm sorry you can't go to the press conference, but I understand you're injured and you should seek treatment. So what's the difference between that and Naomi Osaka? She's saying, I'm ill also. I'm not feeling so good. You really don't want me to be in a press conference. It's just that you can't see my illness. So you think that I'm some kind of weak person and so on and so on. What's the backup plan? For example, then Federer's coach might be, might, might be contractually bound to come on and speak about that illness. Um, by the same token, if someone is depressed and unable to attend the press conference, but still able to play tennis, then there should be a workaround where somebody else is deputized to speak for her. They got, you know, in sports, we, we know the concept of a substitute. So they could have organized a substitute, maybe Naomi Osaka's coach to come on to explain um, what's going on, how he felt the match went, because that sort of insight is exactly what the press conference is about. Sometimes athletes don't express things as well as their, their coaches. So you can still have a piece that comes out that says, oh, after the match, Naomi Osaka's coach observed that at this point, she was strong, but at that point, she was weak. And in the next match, they're going to work on this and that. The Naomi Osaka incident was not well handled because she did come out and say that she wasn't keen on the press conferences. And she said it publicly. Uh, and the sponsors reacted publicly as well. I don't know whether they reached out to her privately. It doesn't feel like that. So um, it became one of these public, you say, I say, you say, I say. And you know, when, when the public is um, looking at this, who are they gonna side with? Are they gonna side with uh, the star that they've been following that has risen and have won championships? Or are they gonna side with the faceless media organization or the faceless organizers? For sure, they'll side with the star. And then there'll be memes coming out saying, oh, you know, this and that. No one's putting out memes in support of organizers. So uh, corporations, they do a very important part. Without them, you won't have all these sports events that we enjoy. But they got to stop thinking uh, of things the old fashioned way. And definitely, although I'm a lawyer, I would say the law is the last resort. Looking at the contract is the last resort. If something happens and then you get an army of lawyers to go through your 100 page contract and say, ha, we caught him, clause 36.9, mm -hmm. that prevents him from doing this. You've already lost because nobody wants to reach a stage where you're suing. Imagine if this Ronaldo incident happened just in the 2000s, not, not today, but just maybe 20 years ago. I bet you it will be so small and insignificant, it would not have mattered and nobody would have remembered it. And um, today, because everyone has a phone with a camera in it, the, the incident spreads like wildfire. 
And because everyone has access to social media, they start commenting and they start showing their support. Um, that, that's probably a, a good thing. So uh, sponsors have to be a lot smarter now. They have to start thinking of ways to co-opt the public and the crowd into their campaigns. Um, I think there are many, um, many ideas on, on how to do that. But once again, um, that old way of thinking, the old playbook, not going to work. The key to all these legal arrangements is this concept of good faith. Good faith means not catching people out, um, not doing something unexpected, not taking advantage. If you're the little guy, uh, when you sign a contract, you got to read it. That's your responsibility. You got to act in the spirit of things. So, um, organizers too, they have to be as specific as possible that what they want is already spelled out. It should make the contract thinner because it should be as specific as possible. It's very easy to have a contract with Ronaldo for the Coca-Cola. It will just take two pages. You are supposed to attend a press conference and during a press conference, there'll be some beverages in front of you and they could be from this range, Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew, etc., etc. So please sign to say that you agree with this arrangement. And it's easy for the guy to read. The guy will say, okay, it's not 100 pages, it's just two pages, and I don't agree to this. Can we talk about it? And his people will talk to your people, and it'll be sorted out. There'll be some other way of promoting your brand. Um, like I said, if it's not sorted out, then it's best that it's not sorted out earlier rather than later. So um, why are contracts so thick anyway? Um, I feel that if a contract is very thick, it usually means that the people who are signing it are not really sure what they want yet. So they want to cover all the bases. You cannot do this, you cannot do that, you cannot do that. You must do this, you must do that. And it just becomes a monster because the other side signing it will say, okay, in that case, I want to put in this clause that says I will do this, but sometimes I won't. And I will I'll say this, but sometimes I won't. And I cannot do this, but sometimes I will. And then both sides will sign it and then they hope and pray that they never have to read the 100 page thing again. It's terrible. I hate contracts like that. So um, everyone needs to, to rethink uh, today. I think this uh, Ronaldo situation uh, gives everyone a chance to, to reboot and say um, exactly what is it that we're trying to get our heroes to do. Mm -hmm.